Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Twit Specials is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twit Live Special number 296, recorded August 16, 2016. The Intel Developer Forum 2016. This Twit Live Special is brought to you by Braintree. Mobile app development can be complex, but integrating your payments no longer has to be. With Braintree, your business can accept nearly every type of payment from any device with just one integration. Learn more at braintreepayments.com slash twit. Are you a maker? Are you a programmer? Are you a coder? Are you a tinkerer? Are you someone who just likes to put things together? Because if so, you're a developer, and a developer needs food for thought. And that's why Twit TV has brought you to the Moscone Center in San Francisco, California for the Intel Developer Forum 2016. It's late at night. You're working on a project that's taken you days and days to put together, and suddenly you get the infamous blue screen. Well, folks, I know, I know you're upset, I know you're mad, but calm down a little bit because it might not actually be the, so the fault of the software. You may just have experienced a cosmic bit flip. That's why I'm speaking with Noah from Intel Software and Services, who's going to explain why their CubeSats might shed some new insight into what the sun does to our electronics. Noah, we've seen this happen many times where there's an inexplicable fault when it causes an error that shuts the system down or creates a weird pattern inside of electronics. Tell me, what does your group do to make sure we're guarded against that uh, random bit flip? Well. We've worked with the Naval Postgraduate School on the concept of a tiny sensor network that could be deployed in space called a femtosatellite. The idea of a femtosatellite is that you can deploy a tiny satellite in space with significantly lower cost and with significantly lower size. And in deploying many of them, hundreds if not thousands of them, in one of these, you can create a sensor network in space that can do advanced detection techniques and many benefits for the common good in society that you would not normally have been able to do if you had a Volkswagen bus sized satellite spinning around the earth every once in a while. So a lot of problems we've had in the past with detecting cosmic radiation, even GPS. Um, random number generation, and many other detections of cosmic phenomena could be done much better with a large-scale tiny sensor network rather than many large ones spinning around. And with the idea of these femtosatellites powered by an Intel D2000 microcontroller and coded with Intel System Studio for microcontrollers, we can essentially democratize space in a way that we can not only do more things, but allow more people to be able to do those things. So if you notice right here with this, this demo right here, we have a small scale replica of asteroid Ida, and we put a, my, a magnet in the middle here. This is one workload that is actually included in the installation of Intel System Studio for microcontrollers to where you can detect movement, position, and temperature with these three different workloads. And we were thinking, okay, if we're gonna demonstrate this at IDF, what is something that people can do themselves? We didn't do any additional coding. These were included in the installation with some small modifications. And it's a really fresh concept, the idea of the Internet of Things in space. Um, but Intel being you know, very forward thinking, um, we thought we would show this and kind of show people what could be possible um, if you rethink how and why satellites are built. Now, I, I love the concept, and of course, smaller satellites spread over a much larger area will capture more of the data that you're looking for, but I gotta ask, because this is something that our audience is gonna ask, what, what are you hoping to find? I mean, what kind of data do you wanna collect about cosmic radiation, and how would that possibly inform Intel's decisions going into the future of 
the Internet of Space things? Well, when you think about the idea of a femto satellite, you can think of it as a farthest edge device. You've got to communicate back to some sort of gateway. And then from that gateway, you can send that data to some sort of server network, cloud, whatever, whatever you want to call it. And then from all the data gathered, either stitch that data together to, to do a, a full picture or use some sort of data analytics. So while this is one edge device, when you look at the different things that, you know, they're going to be talking about with the keynotes with IDF, you know, you've got a server story here. You've got a gateway story. Um, this is one piece of a much bigger puzzle to where my group, the developer products division, we have a tool suite that is tightly coupled to the hardware that you can use to create not only an end-to-end -end Internet of Things set up in this case, but you can do this with any other sort of IoT solution on the Earth's surface, you know? As normal, that technology will eventually trickle down to terrestrial applications. Thank you very much for speaking with me about this because I'm, I'm hooked on everything about space. But if they wanted to find out more about this, more about the, the FEM satellites, FEMTO satellites, where can they go? Well, um, the first thing you can do is check out um, the International Space Station Design Challenge. You can also look up the CubeSat project. Um, and uh, if you want to learn about the tools that we used, we didn't use any crazy advanced tools. These are included in the installation. So if you go to the Intel System Studio, Intel System Studio for microcontrollers, you can do this. You know when they say don't try this at home? We actually want you to try this at home. You can do this uh, with relative ease. Um, we actually had uh, many different interns uh, actually get these up and going um, you know, with some small modifications. Thank you very much for spending time with us, for sharing this vision of the future. And folks, maybe when the IOT grows up, it'll be the IOOT, the Internet of Orbiting Things. Thank you. If you live in the IT world, then you've heard about Ubuntu. It's that operating system that you're going to find in top of rack switches, that you're going to find in more computers facing the Internet than any other in the world. And also, did you know, you're going to find it in the makerspace. That's right, I'm here at the Canonical booth trying to find out what Ubuntu is going to do in the next device that you might be building. Now, when we think of Ubuntu, we think of a, of a lightweight operating system that's full-featured, that uh, has just grown over the years. Tell us a little bit about this announcement you have that they're growing into the makerspace. Sure, so today Intel announced two different items with Ubuntu and Ubuntu Core, both targeting the makerspace. The Intel Joule is a IoT board, four core Intel integrated uh, real sense camera, and it's made for makers to build their devices, whether it be a drone, a gateway, it's the exact same board they can start building in their device, and then they can go into mass production. They don't have to change boards. And they can do that, they can build their applications or their snaps with Ubuntu, and they can deploy at large scale with management with snappy Ubuntu core. Of course, I, I am a fan of Ubuntu. I mean, I've been using it for quite a while, but there might be makers out there who wonder why they'd want to use your OS versus something else, another Linux distro, or maybe even Windows 10 Internet of Things edition. What are the features that you think they could get out of Ubuntu that they couldn't get out of something else? So with Ubuntu Core, what you get is application isolation and security built from the ground up. And what that really means is uh, device manufacturers can build devices with a lot of headroom for those devices. When people bring a new device to market, they don't know what is everything is going to be used in that device. They don't know, am I going to be having my device do temperature? Am I going to be having it do um, humidity? Am I going to have it do lighting control? And with Ubuntu Core, you can have all those different applications and you can have more after the fact and you can be assured via application isolations that they'll keep working seamlessly and together. And of course, the fact that I can quickly spool up the services that I need means that I can go from prototype to design to actual existing in the real world to product much more quickly. But now I got to ask you the question that everybody who ever designs anything from the Internet of Things needs to think about, and that is security. If I'm going to be building this into those Joule system on module devices that I can buy from Intel, I need to make sure that my operating system isn't going to be owned the first time it touches the Internet. What kind of protection do I bring into a design process if I'm using Ubuntu? 
So with Ubuntu, from the ground up, working with the hardware manufacturers, we support CPM2, which is supported by Intel, of course. And then the applications contain all their dependencies, and they run in an environment as if they're the only application on that device. So there's they, by design, are in a read-only environment, and so other applications can't write in their namespace. They have their own unique area where they only they can write. And so people, um, applica other applications can't get in by definition. The application developer has to allow sharing of data or request other data to come in. John, I got to ask you a question that, uh, it's a little difficult to answer because I'm going to ask you to be a, a fortune teller here. Where do you see this moving in the next three years, the next four years? In other words, when I come back to Intel Developer Forum in say 2020, what do you want to see Ubuntu being a part of? Do you want it to be in every device, in, in every switch, in every computer, in every laptop? What's a realistic expectation for the growth of already the most popular Linux distro on the planet? It's really an easy question. You're going to see Ubuntu everywhere where computing has to occur. You know, it used to be that computing would happen where IT departments wanted to be computing and then they get the data there. Now we're in a world where computing happens where the data is. And right, so you need to have data at the edge, right? You need to have data. If you're in a car, you don't want to send those sensor data up to the cloud to tell me, oh, is there some incoming truck coming at me, right? If you're in security, you want the encryption done locally. You need that lot of control. So you're going to see Ubuntu everywhere and many, many devices. Um, it's already in many devices and you'll just see it in more. John, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your insight. If they wanted to find out more about Canonical, more about the release of products, where should they go? They should go to Ubuntu.com slash IoT or Ubuntu.com slash Internet of Things and they can learn about devices, top of rack switches, and they can also learn about a great developer experience with something called Snapcraft, which help, helps you make these applications. There's even more information at snapcraft.io. There you have it, developers. It's time to start working with the data, with the core, with the edge, with Ubuntu. Pop quiz. Do you know what this is? Of course you know what this is. Everyone knows what this is. This is a USB cable. Now, the younger folks in our audience may not remember time before USB, but us older folks do. We remember serial, both DB9 and DB25. We remember parallel. We remember all the weird protocols and connection types that we needed to connect one device to another. Well, that pretty much went away with USB. And the people that we have to thank for that is the USB Implementers Forum. They have been shepherding this technology for almost two decades, which is why I'm happy to speak with the president and CEO of the USBIF, Mr. Jeff Ravencraft. Thank you very much for speaking with us. Yeah, thanks for having us. We appreciate it, and it's a pleasure to be here with you today. So. Now, our audience is pretty techie, so they understand that specs get developed, that protocols get developed. They, they've probably seen the development of USB from the 1.0 version, which was just, a, you know, let's, let's just be honest, low speed, but high speed from back then, all the way up to now where we have USB 10 gig. Tell me, what has the process been like? As you, as you develop the technology, as the standards boards come to you, what have you seen in USB? Well, I mean, the process is amazing to go from a piece of paper to actually having something for the consumer to buy at the store. That whole thing is a huge effort. And uh, you have to get it from beyond the spec to getting the industry to engage. Um, I, I call it coopetition, so that they have to cooperate in the beginning. They get the spec done, compliance. And then they once we built kind of the pie, then they have to all compete for a piece of the pie. But we've seen everything, not only in data rate, but now with USB, right, we have uh, performance at 10 gig. We're now delivering power up to 100 watts for fast, fast charging. And then we have this brand new, easy to use, convenient cable and connector for the consumer that delivers all that. And in addition, now we can run other protocols over this new cable and connector, like DisplayPort or MHL, um, that uh, really is driving USB as a single cable connection, the last cable you'll ever need. So it's really gone from just a simple data connection and an easy way to plug things into your computer without having to open it up, to now it's not only delivering data, it's power, audio, video for 4K, um, it's convenience, and it's running other protocols on top of a USB cable and connector. So, I mean, it's amazing. 
Now let's talk a little bit about one of the themes you brought up, this coopetition. It, it would seem to us, the outsiders, to, to look at the manufacturers and say, it makes sense that you would want to use the same connector. It makes sense that you would want to stay within the same spec because you're not competing on the USB type that you're using. You're competing on the features of the actual product. But let's be honest, we have seen some very interesting moves over the years from vendors switching pins so that you have to buy cables for them to other vendors who will not be named who decide that there's a competing standard that they would prefer to use. In fact, we've seen a few of those come and go, like, for example, Firewire. What is it like to be uh, the elder statement, a statement of, uh, of universal connectivity, of a single wire connectivity, while all these other newer players try to, say, offer something, quote unquote, better? Yeah, I mean, I really think it comes down to um, the consumer makes a choice, right? And it's, it's a price point, it's a feature benefit, it's a convenience, um, it's uh, multiple suppliers, right, that drives uh, volume pricing and so forth, competitive pricing. So I think that's one of the great things about USB is that it really is a universal solution. And there are many, many players, because the specs are open, um, there's no royalty, at least through you know the USB IF or the, the, uh, the promoters of the spec. Um, it's a royalty-free technology, and that's really driven um, not only adoption, but when you get adoption and volume, you get very, very competitive pricing. You have a competitive supply chain for manufacturers, and the end result is the consumer gets lots of products, lots of choices, uh, stuff that's very easy to use, and it just works, and they get it at a very great price, right? And so... It's amazing to be involved in this technology as long as I have and see this coopetition because we sit in big rooms with big companies and we all have to get together and, and figure out what's the best solution and work together on that. But once that spec gets out there, then, you know, people are going to go compete on it. And like you said, there's a baseline and then there are features and benefits above that. And, uh, and that's where they drive their differentiation in the marketplace. But yeah, it's exciting. Let's do a little bit of a dive into the actual technologies that exist in the convention center just a block away from us. USB IF's big announcement has been sort of the standardization of power. Those, those manufacturers that want to do a single cable. So for example, in the back here, we have production units of monitors and notebooks that have a single cable from the monitor to the notebook that gives me display connectivity and can charge my notebook. What, where do you see this going? I know you have different levels of power that you can provide through the USB connectivity, but where does that end? Is it just faster, more power, or does the USB IF have a roadmap for where this technology should take us in the future? Well, it's a great question. And I think, you know, again, uh, looking back 20 years ago, we had no idea USB would be on the forefront of bleeding technology today, 20 years later. And here we are. Um, there are things we're already under development. We're looking at um, audio, delivering audio, digital audio over the USB Type-C connector. So the audio port that is on that MacBook, that's the only other port on the MacBook, other than the type C connector. Eventually that audio port could go away and we deliver digital audio over type C. And the same thing with this phone. This phone's got an audio port on it, right? And in the future, we could deliver digital audio over our type C connector. The other things that we're working on is we are enhancing USB video. Um, out of the box, what I'll call USB video versus alt mode with display port or MHL or whoever it might be. Um, so that is under development. We also just announced uh, an authentication spec, and this allows uh, hosts and devices to authenticate each other. You can authenticate cable. You can authentic, uh, authenticate a power supply or a device. And this is really uh, for OEMs who do not want malicious USB devices connecting to their products. And we've enabled that with this authentication spec. Um, and so these are just three things that are on the burner right now that, that we're delivering and working on. And we're going to continue to see that grow. I mean, as the technology changes, uh, we're going to be right there, right? And... Um, 
again, here we are 20 years later and we're still innovating over USB. So I, I think there's plenty of room for, for more things to come. I got to say our audience is going to be excited by this. A single connection, a single type of adapter that can give me power, that can be, give me data, that can give me high-speed data, that can build in security to make sure that unauthorized devices aren't attached to my laptop, my desktop. You, you, it sounds as if this could be something that people just expect in the future. And of course, I think that's what any standards body wants. Jeff, thank you very much for speaking with us. Thank you very much for sharing your time. If they wanted to find out more about USB-IF, where should they go? They go to www.usb.org. And we'll look forward to seeing you there. Thank you very much. And remember, folks, it's USB, one cable to rule them all. If you're a developer looking for a next-gen application that requires maybe a virtual reality headset, an augmented reality piece of gear, you could buy several different adapters, trying to hard code it for every output you might need, or you could just come here to Lattice Semiconductor. I'm speaking with Abdullah, who's going to explain why their bridge can go from anything to anything. Abdullah, why do we need a bridge? If I'm going to be developing a video application, what does that equipment allow me to do? So your video can be generated from multiple camera sensors. There's camera sensors that have CMOS uh, interfaces. They have sub-LVDS interfaces. They have MIPI, CFI, DFI, different interfaces out there. Sometimes when you're a developer, you want to have a different interface for different use cases, right? You want to have depth perception. That's a dim different image sensor. You want to have a camera that's going to be able to see what you're seeing so that you can get that into your virtual reality wor world. That's a different image sensor. So you're going to want to interface all these different image sensors. You're going to need a flexible bridge, something that can support all of those IOs. In addition, you also want to be able to connect to external consoles. Maybe you want to connect directly to a PC, an Xbox, a PlayStation uh, 4. All of these have different inter video interfaces as well. So it depends on where you're getting your video image from, you want to interface it, you want to drive different displays, come talk to us, we can help you bridge those. Oh, in the past, how would a developer do this? If, if I was creating an application that required, again, maybe 15 different types of sensors that needed different input to different outputs, I would have to hard code different bridges, I would have to have different types of bridges and switch between them. Is, what, what was the old way of switching? So there are dedicated bridges out there in the market, they're ASSP, ASIC type solutions, so you have to wait until the semiconductor developer develops a bridge for your specific use case. Well, you don't want to wait, and think about this, A6 uh, lead times are about two years to develop something from conception to having a production ready silicon. With an FPGA, you think about something, a week later you have a solution. That's the value of us. Okay, and I've heard this before. I mean, FPGA is fantastic because of its flexibility, but there are going to be those hardcore developers who say, it just doesn't have the performance of an ASIC. I just can't get the frame weight. I just can't get the resolution because I lose a little bit in overhead. What would you say to those folk? When it comes to processing, if you want to use an ASIC or some kind of microprocessor, every processing element happens in series. So you got to really speed up your clock, you're really going to burn power. Yes, you can get very fast, but you're going to burn a lot of power. With an FPGA, you can reduce your clock rate and you can parallelize all of that processing capability. So we can get to that level of throughput, plus we can reduce our clock rates, thereby reducing the power. So it's, it's back to the old argument of uh, better coding or lazy developer. <laughs> Great way to put it. Now, if they wanted to take a look at these solutions, if they wanted to find out how maybe your silicon could fit into their project, what would be the steps? How would they, would they come to you with a problem or would they just say, no, send us a couple of units and uh, we'll try to integrate it into our product? So one thing that we try to do is we come up with full solutions. We don't want to give you the building blocks and make you go and do it. We have full solutions, full development kits already available. So if you have an idea, we may have already solved it. Come to our website, look at the solutions we have available, and if we have something, great. If we don't, come and tell us, say, hey, we have this problem, you don't have a ready solution, can you help us? We can probably help customize a solution for you, or we can recommend a third party that can help customize a solution, or we can work with you very closely and give you the tools needed so that you can customize a solution for your needs. Abdullah, before we go, we have to give our audience a concrete example because they might be interested in the tech, but what would be one of the more imaginative uses of your bridge in a product? All right, so think about you got a virtual reality headset. You have two eyes, right and left. You want to drive both of them. You want to drive a lot of resolution. We're talking 2K video per eye. So when you got your image, your source is coming from maybe there's a camera sensor, maybe it's an external PC, maybe it's some other different type of video source. You want to be able to drive those video sources and not only drive a single display, but you got to split. 
split the right half of the eye and the left half of the eye, and they're both not going to be seeing exactly the same thing. Plus, think about this. As you're turning your head to the right or to the left, your right eye or your left eye is going to see the object first. So you need to have some kind of time delay. So your FPGA can add that kind of time delay into your, vi your field of vision. Plus, you also want to differentiate what you're looking at. Sometimes you want to have more resolution, more pixels exactly where you're looking at. With an FPGA, if you have a, a video, uh, sorry, an image sensor looking directly back at your eye, you can see where your eye is looking. You can track your eyeball. And if you can track your eyeball, you can enhance that portion of the video image. All of this happens with the FPGA portion. Resolution on demand. That's, that's some pretty next-gen stuff. Uh, if they wanted to find out more about your bridge, if they wanted to find out more about Lattice Semiconductor, where should they go? Come to Lattice Semiconductor web page, look at the Crosslink product. That is the product that's doing all of this great stuff that we talked about today. Abdullah, thank you very much for talking with us. Thank you for spending time and for developing this technology. If you are a developer looking for a way to get from point A to point B, maybe you need a bridge. In an increasingly connected world, one of the issues that we need to deal with is harassment, cyberbullying, anything you want to call it, it's become a problem, which is why Intel has hack harassment. I'm speaking with Chris Liu, who's going to explain how you can hack harassment. Chris, this is one of those touchy subjects going back before Gamergate. It's the whole idea of, do you ignore people who are harassing you? Do you actively try to bring them into the light? Do you try to identify them? What has Intel tried to do to bring together the, the luminaries in the tech world to hack harassment? So certainly what we need to do first and foremost is understand that we need to elevate the conversation around the impact of online harassment on both the individuals and the digital communities that they belong to. Recognizing that that has a very real impact is the first step in us being able to engage in a productive conversation that gets people to think about how we can change our behaviors, how we can develop new solutions, and how we can all collaborate to combat online harassment. Uh, that all sounds good. Let, let's take a step back for a moment because there's going to be people out there who say, wait a minute, if there's someone harassing you on Twitter, you just block them or you mute them. Or if there's someone who's sending you emails, you just delete the emails. Or if there's someone who's following you around from site to site, posting nasty comments, just don't read them. Why doesn't that work? I mean, why, why don't we just stop at that? Say it's your job to make sure that you're safe online. That puts a lot of the onus on the person that's being targeted by harassment. And we all can't just turn off our social media platforms, disconnect from all of our devices. We need those devices to be part of the smart and connected world. And we need it to be a safe and un inclusive smart and connected world. We can't ignore the use of technology in our jobs. It's completely changed the way that we interact with our friends and family, the way that we do our jobs, and the way we run our companies, um, the way we interact with all the various communities that we want to be a part of. And to feel like you have to separate yourself from that just because you are being targeted by harassment specifically is unfair to that person, as well as all the people that belong to those digital communities. We want to make sure it's safe and inclusive of everyone. Right, and ultimately I think that's what it comes down to for the reasonable people who say, look, why should I have to live in fear or why should I have to take that extra step because X person or, or Y number of people want to harass me. They want to force me off the internet by bullying me. Now, you've done the first step, which is to bring together companies like Vox, like Intel, to, to make that pledge, to, to bring professionals, the developers around here and say, look, will you do your part to, to hack this harassment? But what does that mean? I mean, what's the next step? I mean, once you have everyone in agreement that this is a problem that needs to be dealt with, what are the practical things that we can do to stop it? So certainly everyone can take steps to combat online harassment by getting engaged with your community, making sure that it's uh, that everyone's aware of what's okay and what's not okay to do within these communities. At the same time, what we're really trying to focus on is developing technology solutions that can help combat online harassment. So one of the things we'd like to engage with the developer community like here at IDF is to make sure that we have a way to bring everyone into an open source community that can innovate on real technology solutions that can reduce the frequency of online harassment as well as reduce the impact of that online harassment. So just smarter filters, hardware that can actually identify itself, or the, the ability to, to keep someone from jumping from account to account to account in order to continue his or her harassment. Yeah, certainly we don't want technology just to be the place where harassment lives. We want it to be part of the solution as well. And so we're actually going to hackathons throughout the next year, uh, encouraging people to join us and hack harassment together and innovate on new things that can be done to, as you said, you know, combat online harassment. 
Chris, I think, I think you're onto something here. I think this is the right approach. I think, yes, it's good to get together the, the, the companies that really lead this communication revolution, but at the same time, unless you start at the bottom, unless you start with the developers and the users who are actually affected by the harassment, things will never change. And maybe, maybe with Intel behind it, going to the different shows and conferences and gatherings and telling people, look, this is your internet, take control, take charge, maybe, maybe that will make a difference. Now, if they wanted to find more about hacking harassment, if they wanted to find out where they could sign the pledge, where should they go? So you should go to hackharassment.com and sign the pledge with us. Chris, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your important work. And folks, if you're tired of cyberbullying, maybe it's time to hack harassment. We'll get back to the action here at the Intel Developer Forum in San Francisco, but first, let's take a moment to thank the sponsor of this Twit Live special. Now, let me ask you, are you a developer? Because if you are, at some point you're looking to get paid. I mean, yes, it's nice to develop for the fun of it, for the passion, just for the tech, but yeah, you're going to need some sort of income if you want that development to continue, which is why we're happy to have Braintree as a sponsor of this Twit Live special. Now, Braintree is a different way to think of payments. No longer do you have to develop your own solution, your own contracts with a payment processor, with a, a data center. You just go to Braintree and their full stack solution, and you're good to go. Now, by next year, maybe even next week, there could be a whole new way to pay. Maybe it will be the next Bitcoin or even the next Apple Pay or maybe even both. But fortunately, Braintree's full stack payment platform is easily adaptable to whatever the future holds. That means that you can adapt too. It accepts everything from pounds to PayPal to that next big innovation from any device with just one integration. And when that new payment method comes along, you don't have to rework your entire app, your entire service, your entire solution. All you have to do is update a few lines of code. That means no more late nights, no complicated recoding, no stress about staying ahead of the curb. Braintree Payments is here to help. So here's what we want you to do. We want you to try Braintree. Try the easiest way to accept multiple payment types with one integration. Integrating it into your app is as easy as inserting a few lines of code. You can learn more at BraintreePayments.com slash twit. That's BraintreePayments.com slash twit. And we thank Braintree for their support of this Twit Live Special. At the Intel Developer Forum, you do see a lot of very high-level technologies, managers for containers and IT infrastructure, but you also get to see the technology that consumers will see on a day-to-day -day basis. That's why we're here at Symbi. I'm speaking with Shaw, who's going to explain what the tally can do if you run a retail market. Shaw, what is this robot that's running behind us? Uh, so what you see here is Tally. Uh, Tally is a fully autonomous mobile robot that uh, drives up and down the aisles at uh, retail stores. And it automatically scans the shelves using its sensors, and it's able to detect which products, it, which products are there, which ones are it, which ones are understocked, overstocked, mispriced, mislabeled, uh, in the wrong place, and then alert the retailer so that they can correct it. Now that last bit, the, the misplaced stock, I think that one is huge because you can kind of see, glancing down an aisle when stock is running low on a particular shelf, but as we all know, the whole idea of cart abandonment isn't just on Amazon. You get people who say, I don't really want this, and they put it up on any old shelf. This can actually find out throughout the store when a product has been put on the wrong shelf and alert someone to move it back? Sure, yeah. and. Um, uh, but the, I don't want to uh, understate the out of stock, the out of stock problem, because that is a big problem. That's actually the biggest problem that that tally solves. So when you walk into a store and a product is not there, that costs retailers a lot of money, billions of dollars a year. Uh, tally is able to accurately, with nearly 100% accuracy, uh, tell you that uh, if something is missing or you know uh, not being properly presented. And more than that, it gives you real-time insight to what your stock is doing. What is moving? What's not moving? Exactly. Is anything mispriced according to the, the, the main catalog of pricing that you might have? Now, but tell me this. I know some of this technology has been around for a while. We've, we've created robots that can, can do uh, avoidance. It can make sure it can go safely around an area. But you've also included a package of sensors. What kind of sensors do you need to, do, uh, to have in order to do what it's doing? So Tally has a variety of sensors on it. Um, uh, the biggest two are, it has 3D cameras on the front, you can see on the top. Uh, these are the Intel RealSense cameras, and one of the main reasons we're here at the Intel Developer Forum. Uh, you can see it visualized up there on that screen. Um, and uh, it has a LiDAR uh, that can see 270 degrees, and uh, 
uh, which it uses for map making and figuring out where it is in in the store. All right, now let's let's say that I'm a I'm a shopping center executive, and I'm going to pose you the question. That I'm sure you're going to hear a lot, which is, at the price point that these robots are going to be available, I might be able to hire a low-level employee to do what Tally is doing for half the price. How would you sell me on the technology behind Tally? Uh, so you know, today humans you know are doing this task already, right? They're going around, they're doing inventory, and uh, but if you look at the industry-wide average. Uh, accuracy, it's only about 65%. Our robot gets closer to 100%, can do it way faster, way cheaper, um, and it doesn't, it, it doesn't get rid of any jobs. It's actually just, now the employees don't have to do that job. They're just being told, hey, you need to go over here, restock these items, you need to go fix, fix this aisle over here. Um, it just streamlines their entire business, and then the customers who come to their store are much happier because what they want is always there, properly stocked um, and employees are happy because they don't want to do this job you know we've been told while we're in the store by active employees like you know thank god for tally <laughs> and, and really who doesn't want to see a robot wandering down the aisles oh what is your game plan when do you see these deployed in the corner market when will these start making it into into vons and safeways what would be the five-year plan for simbi um, so currently, uh, Tally, uh, we're in pilot deployments with uh, many top tier retailers. Uh, that's right now confidential. Um, but I'm optimistic, obviously. I see Tally in every, in every store in America within you know, the next few, next few years. It's, it's a no-brainer. Thank you for sharing your time. Thank you for sharing your technology. If they wanted to find out more about the Tally or more about anything that Symbi is working on, where can our audience go? So go to simbirobotics.com, uh, S-I-M-B-E, robotics.com. Robotics, it's not just the future, it's the tally. A decade ago, virtual machines changed the face of the IT world. No longer did we need racks and racks of pizza boxes, each running their own operating system, their own instances of services, but we could spin them up and down on demand. Well, recently we've seen the surge of a new technology, the container. It's a wonderful piece of tech that allows me to have a lightweight deployment of the services and the apps that I need. But the question has become, are they ready for the enterprise? That's why I'm speaking with Josh Ellithorpe here at AppSera, who's going to explain why now might be the time to move to containers. Josh, what's wrong with just running containers as is in the enterprise? So the same issue existed when VMs were first developed and first starting to get deployed, is you need good comprehensive tooling around scheduling, policy management, security, and make sure that what you're scheduling is guaranteed not to affect other workloads in your system and that you get the stability you need for your mission critical systems. You want to be able to deploy to multiple uh, environments and multiple infrastructures. So you want tooling that works in AWS, GCE, vSphere, OpenStack. And that is the reality of the market today if you look at, a, uh, at our offering and a few other of the really orchestration tools available to, to containers today. I think that's really the big point for the folks out there who actually have deployed containers because I use them in my home office. I've got containers that run on my, uh, my Synology NAS, which is fantastic. But if I'm going to move that from one, two, ten, a dozen different containers to literally thousands of containers that need to spin up and down, not just on the same platform, but across the cloud on AWS, on Azure, it starts to become a problem. So what do I do? If I need the ability to manage all those instances while at the same time managing the resource allocation, what can I use? So what you want to do is you want to look at a platform like our AppSera platform, or if you're in the open source space, you could look at solutions like Kubernetes, where you can install a platform that will be responsible for the scheduling, the resource management, and the availability of your containers. And that's health monitoring, logging aggregation, and then also brings in convenient services, persistent storage, database service access, access to in-memory data stores like Redis or Memcache, and also your message brokers like RabbitMQ or Nats, and making sure that those work seamlessly within your platform, can easily be deployed, and that you get this single pane of glass across all your infrastructure. Whether that is bare metal 
virtual or you're still using virtualization, we actually like to think that this is the resurgence of some of the bare metal tech, as you no, no longer need those heavyweight virtualization systems to manage the workloads that are being deployed in your platform. This reduces cost. So you can have bare metal connected to your public cloud. If you're still using virtualization, you can deploy it on top of VMware or OpenStack. You can manage them, do all your policy controls, your network isolation in one place, describe your infrastructure, and then run. And you get the tools that are available for your IT operations team as well as your developer team so that they can have the fast, agile environments that they want for containers, but your IT staff knows that the deployments are secure and that they can audit and manage them effectively. I think that is the absolute key because I know with containers I'm going to get a super lightweight package that will run quickly. It gets me the performance I want, but as an IT admin, I'm thinking performance is great, but if one container leaks into another or if someone figures out how to breach a container and therefore gain access to the internal network, that's, that's absolutely a non-starter. What can I do to avoid that? I mean, of course, I'm going to be driving you towards the AppSera platform, Absolutely. but what are, the, what are the ways that you design your container network in order to make sure that doesn't happen? Okay, so first, we have a uh, technology we like to call nano-segmentation. And we modeled that off of what uh, VMware called micro-segmentation, which was the isolation of the network per VM. But that's not good enough if you have hundreds, if not thousands of containers deployed, potentially a dozen on one VM. You don't want your network isolation to live at that layer anymore. So we provide a full whitelist-based approach to networking and multiple networking modes that are completely isolated. So by default, you get no egress. When you link two containers together, you only get the network routes you absolutely need. If you do need broadcast semantics or more layer two general semantics, we offer a virtual layer two network that we built on top of OVS. This allows you to join your containers and it looks like they have an open network, but it is isolated from everything else in the system. Then we also manage all of the load balancing and announcing that to your load balancer, all of the routing, DNS management, so that you can make sure that when you deploy it, that you can get a URL that you can go to right away. And we do all of that stuff end to end. We manage your HTTPS certificates. And we really have built some additional value added technology on top of Nginx, where we actually use signed encrypted JWT tokens on our data plane, on our control plane, and make sure that nothing can be forged in the system. No one can accidentally add a route. No one can accidentally launch a container that was not approved. All of this is completely locked down by the platform so that we can give you those levels of trust that have not been available before. And I think that's really what we're looking for. This idea that even if a container gets breached, even if it gets owned, you can't see anything. It, it literally looks like an air-gapped machine. And I think that's really the best policy in, in order to, to have real white list access to your network. Not only do we do the network isolation, we give you a dedicated LVM volume for your container. So you're not even on a shared disk. You can actually manage the exact disk. Every resource is completely isolated. We even do the network bandwidth tracking as well, giving you network reservations as well as network burst rates to guarantee that even on the network side, you don't have network starvation between your containers, features that are really missing from a lot of platforms today. All right, Josh, I'm going to ask you to stare into your crystal ball here and, and, and give us a little bit of the future because there are a lot of people who say that this, this last piece, the, the security and the management of containers, is really the only thing that was holding it back from complete and wholesale adoption over virtual machines. With the emergence of t platforms like AppSera that can actually give you that modicum of security, that can give you that assurance that your policies will be maintained within the network, where do you see this kind of technology being in the next three, four, five years? In a decade, will we see VMs at all? So I think that you're always going to see some level of VMs. And the reason for that is, A, containerization hasn't happened for Windows. We're not sure what the adoption there is going to be. So with Windows Servers 2016 with constant delays, we don't know when that technology is truly going to hit. So there's going to be VMs running your Windows-based infrastructure for some time. Now on the Linux side, I do think that containers are really the way to go. However, I do see the virtual machine landscape changing, not necessarily disappearing. I see people be using um, more commodity tools like OpenStack for their virtualization as they rely on it less. They want to avoid the 
expensive pieces of virtualization that VMware has brought to the table. I see them cutting costs there as they move to containers. But it's really, to me, about immutable workloads. I have something I can run anywhere that understands service discovery, understands that I can place it, and that I'm going to give it the creds to the things that it needs to connect to. And by definition, VMs just are not immutable workloads. You have configuration management like Chef and Puppet that complicates out your infrastructure, and you have to manage more pieces. So I do agree. Containers are going to be pervasive. I see the uh, you know, adoption of OCI as something that's very important, a standards-based image format that everyone can use, not just one vendor providing their uh, containerization technology. And I'd like to give you know, some credit to the early container adopters, the guys at OpenVZ, the LXC team, these guys were the true innovators. And now we have nicer wrappers, but really we wouldn't be where we were today, where we are today if it wasn't for Solaris Zones, FreeBSD Jails, and all the other tech that's happened over the last decade. Josh, thank you very much for this quick overview of the future of containers. If they wanted to find out more about AppSera, more about your platform, more about how it could help them with their IT workload, where can they go? They can go to AppSera.com. We have a community edition. It's completely free. It deploys to all the po popular clouds as well as private infrastructure. They can check it out, check out our policy controls, all of our nano segmentation, and it, it has a license that's liberal enough for production use. So they should go check that out and uh, give it a whirl. Thank you, Josh. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your tech. We've been speaking with Josh Elithor from AppSera, where the future is, in a word, containers. There is no doubt that the Internet of Things holds great promise for both IT and the consumer world of electronics. I mean, the ability to gather so much data so quickly can really change the way that we see the world around us. Unfortunately, the IoT has a couple of really unflattering reputations. The first is that is the Internet of Insecure Things, or the Internet of Own Things, or the Internet of Things that will kill your network. But what if I told you that there was a way to use the IoT without opening up a huge security hole into your network. That's why we're here at InfoSwift, and I'm speaking with Phil and Jay, who are going to explain what their platform can do for your IoT. Now, Phil, we know that the IoT has a bad reputation. We, we've seen it in action. We've seen what really bad security can do for someone's network. Tell me, how does that get mitigated if I use InfoSwift? Well, InfoSwift uh, has, takes many different uh, security measures to kind of protect against uh, all these insecure things taking over our network. Um, Jay actually can, can talk a little bit better to the security question, though. Uh, Jay, so how does an IoT device connect to you? Is it using a, a certificate, a self-signed certificate? What kind of protocols do you use to make sure that at least that on the communications level, I'm not owned off the bat? Actually, we use MQTT protocol, which has a username password based authentication. On top of that, we do the SSL. So we have a complete secure uh, connection and we can encrypt the connection as well so that no, there's no man in the middle that can snoop over the traffic. And whatever data we collect, we also secure that on the disk on our server as well as the local uh, like in gateway and things like that uh, in an encrypted manner. So it's end-to-end -end encryption and you only you have the keys and uh, not even InfoSwift can decrypt the data. The data is just goes between your clients and your servers or your devices, and we are just passing that through without interpreting them. So it's a complete secure solution. I think it's, it's that end-to-end -end, uh, encryption that we were really, really looking for because it allows me to say that I've got a secure tunnel between my device and the server that's interpreting the data from that device. I think the man in the middle attack is the one that we were most afraid of. Uh, when, when you sell the solution, how do you do it? Because, I mean, of course, some data I'm going to want to go directly to my premise server. Some data I'm going to want to go into the cloud. Some data I'm going to want to go to an InfoSwift. How, how do I use your solution in a network I may have already deployed? So uh, we are completely flexible to various architectures that any user may want to set up. So depending on the application, you may have your hardware in the field, and that hardware could be uh, from all different vendors using various different communication protocols, maybe Wi-Fi, maybe Zigbee, maybe all sorts of different things. And so, and you want that data to go to different people to be processed differently at different times. Uh, and so we enable you through a pretty robust device management dashboard and 
platform really to define all those pieces and really get you set up in the way that you want. And so it can be really a hybrid cloud and local implementation uh, of the network that you'd like. Uh, actually, Jay, maybe you can speak to what do you think is the biggest mistake that enterprises make when they start to deploy IoT devices? So the, the coding is only you know, one fourth of the solution. The main thing is deployment and scalability. So if you don't plan for scaling, so the, basically there are several stages of the solution. So one is data acquisition, another is data analysis, another is data visualization, and another is controlling or monitoring the devices, this is the reverse uh, bidirectional flow. So all of this have to be done at scale and in a secure manner. So you really need that kind of uh, expertise to develop this end-to-end uh, -end framework. So that's why we provide it as a platform to make it e very easy for enterprises so they don't have to think about all these things. And so they just think about what data they want to send and what data what they want to process and receive. Right, Phil, if I did buy, buy into your platform, if I did start using InfoSwift for my IoT devices, what would be the benefit? What, what can I get from you that I wouldn't be able to get from another vendor? So a lot of vendors, there's hundreds of IoT platforms out there. You know that, we all know that. Um, what we've done differently is we've, we've really uh, focused on the core. A lot of people have a fancy development environment. They have a, a lot of different pieces that t turn into a Frankenstein monster almost. And so we've really built this as a cohesive unit that will enable true real-time communication scalably and securely. And that's something that is extremely in important for enterprise applications. Hopefully you've piqued the interest, especially of our enterprise audience. If they wanted to find out more about InfoSwift, if they wanted to see an actual demonstration, if they maybe wanted to try out your service with their IoT devices, where should they go? InfoSwift.com. So we've got uh, a free uh, trial there. You can connect up to 100 devices, a million messages per month, which is, I, from my understanding, the best free uh, service out there for an IoT platform. Uh, and you can also uh, contact us for demos and uh, setting up a meeting for a little bit more information. But it's, our, our website is where you want to go. Phil, thank you very much. Thank you. Jay, thank you for your time. And maybe, just maybe, it's time for the IoT the InfoSwift of things. Psst, come here. I know you're a geek. You've got to be a geek. I'm a geek. I'm proud to be a geek. And all geeks like speed. So how about this? What about seven gigabytes per second fast? Is that fast enough for you? Well, I hope so, because we came here to Kingston to talk to Cameron Crandall to find out how you're going to get that speed. Cameron, we love SSDs. SSDs give us that ultra-fast transfer rate, the, the, the just crazy amount of IOPS. Tell me, what does Kingston have for the speed demons? So uh, EP1000, uh, which will be our uh, first NVMe uh, PCI Express-based SSD, uh, which is in the case here behind me. Um, and what this drive does is we enable four uh, M.2 NVMe PCI Express devices on a single half-height, half-length card. Uh, we connect that through a PCI Express switch, which gives us that 7 gigabytes per second transfer rate and uh, IOPS over uh, 1.2 million. Now, this, this is actually huge. That switch may sound like just a piece of technology that you threw in there, but it allows you to connect multiple M.2 type devices, PCIe connected devices, without running out of lanes. Unfortunately, this is something that we've seen in ultra high performance machines, where you might be using 32 lanes, two, two SLI video cards next to each other for, for video, and there's not a whole lot left over. What's the practical limit on that switching? How many devices could you put on a single card, and how much throughput would that give us? So, uh, so switching technology with NVMe is going to be uh, very common here in the future. The way we use it on EP1000 is to enable us to connect uh, four, uh, today four drives to a single PCI Express slot. But in the future, we're going to be able to connect you know, eight or 16 drives on larger form factor cards. Um, but there's really no limit as to the number of PCI Express switches you can have um, in, in sort of a fabric topology. Um, and again, we're going to see PCI Express switches used more and more as we begin to scale out PCI Express and data centers. Now, the 1000 could be used by just people who want to have a really fast computer. It's PCIe connected, you plug it in. 
but for the enterprise customer, there's there's been this sort of disconnect because although we love speed, we also need serviceability. And serviceability means that I can't open up a box, power it down, pull out a PCIe card and replace it when I need to, to go to my next unit. You've got a product for those people who need to access front of rack. Tell me about it. Correct. So uh, the name of that product is, um, uh, it used to be called Small Form Factor 8639. It's been officially uh, named U.2, uh, which is the standard two and a half inch drive form factor that we've all been familiar with for many, many years. Uh, but it's going to be PCI Express connected. And we're going to build the drive similarly to how we build the EP1000, have multiple M.2 drives within that two and a half inch form factor and that's going to give us big capacity, high performance, and also using that switching technology uh, to enable uh, bigger capacity and more performance in that smaller form factor. Uh, it's no surprise to our audience that I'm a fan of Kingston. It's in all of my boxes, all of my laptops, all of my servers. But what does the future hold for SSDs? Is it just going to be bigger, faster, smaller? What do you see for Kingston's next year of products? Well, I think uh, SATA is still going to be around for quite some time. Uh, but I think uh, PCI Express is really going to begin to um, be more commonplace in uh, uh, notebooks and desktops as well as in the server space. Um, you know, we just need the price really to come down on, on PCI Express to where it's more comparable with, with serial ATA. And then you as a customer, if you have a choice between a serial ATA drive that runs at 500 megabytes a second versus a PCI Express device that runs at, say, 1,500 or 2,000 megabytes a second, um, you know, most customers are going to gravitate towards, towards PCI Express. So I think, I think for now, over the next you know, 12 to 18 months, I think SATA will, will still dominate. Uh, but definitely PCI Express is really slated to really take over, not only in the client space, but also in the enterprise space as well. Cameron, thank you very much for speaking with us again. It's always a pleasure, especially when you show us things that go really, really fast. Now, if they wanted to find out more about the EP1000 and the EP2500, where can they go? Uh, they can go to our website at www.kingston.com. We're here at the Intel Developer Forum with Kingston because, damn, it's fast. Endpoint isolation is no laughing matter to system admins. In fact, at home, in my office, I actually have a machine, my Synology box, that runs several containers running my browsers because I'm so worried about those browsers getting owned and then having visibility into my network. Well, that setup is not very practical for most people. So instead, if you're running an enterprise, why not speak to the folks at Bromium? Because they've got a way to use micro VMs to protect your network. I'm speaking with Simon Crosby. Simon, what is a micro VM? A micro VM is an isolation construct built using Intel VT and other security features on CPU like SGX. So I say a single task on the end user operating system. So for example, every single tab of my browser, or perhaps every document I get, which is an attachment to my email, files from a USB key, anything you send me via Skype or Twitter, they're all independently hardware isolated from each other and from the operating system. Uh, this is not a new methodology. We've had this around for a while. I could always run a VM on my box yes. and you know, bring it up and then run whatever it is that I'm, I'm questioning and see what it does. But the issue has been resources. I don't want to sit there and wait three minutes for a VM to spin up before I can actually get into the file. What have you done to make that less of a, of a drag on my time? Oh, that's a great question. So for me, a, a micro VM is 15 milliseconds, OK? So on that, and that's on a core i3 or i5 or i7 CPU. So what's happening here is we're doing an instant in-memory fast clone of Windows or Mac OS, depending on whichever you're running. And then, essentially, that there are a couple of other memory pages that are pinned there. But basically, we're taking the page table state from the CPU, marking it all as read-only, putting it into a new Intel VT VMCS, and we have a new VM which is running. And then, as it runs, it's going to execute copy on write. And what that means is that if it changes any memory locations in user mode or in the kernel, those are going to be changed in its own memory context. So we'll copy stuff in. The hypervisor does this. And, uh, and then it changes its own state. So I'll give you an analogy for that. If I put you in the top of a very tall building and say, can you change the city skyline? 
but I give you a dry erase pen, you can scribble on the windows, okay? So that's copy on write. You're changing things, but not really. And so these things execute a task, one task only. It might be a browser renderer, it could be a Word document or something, PDF doc, and there are amazing benefits that accrue. First of all, because there's only one task in the micro VM, we get to be able to analyze its behavior in excruciating detail. We record every packet it sends or receives, every touch on memory, on the virtual file system, on, on the registry, and um, whether we know that it's good or bad, we do this. And so then we can look for deviations from good. Rather than looking for bad, which is the problem of antivirus today, you look for deviations from good. So if it just behaves weirdly, I just start to send all of these forensic details up to security uh, team, to the SOC, and we do this in real time from the protected perspective of, of the microvisor. So that's benefit one. We get, this, we get to use every endpoint as a sensor at a very granular basis for everything it runs. Second, the moment I close that document or the tab of my browser, one instruction on the CPU, the whole thing gets zeroed out and so it self-remediates, which is awesome. So users never need to worry about it. So even if I have CryptoLocker, it's just a don't care. Okay, so the system becomes self-protecting and self-remediating by design. Now we take those forensic uh, fragments which are centralized to the SOC and we then go and search every other endpoint in the enterprise to see if we can see this thing anywhere else. And we have excruciating details. So we see things that are not typically on people's blacklists or, and so on. And, and so my, my PC, which is an unprotected Windows 7 system that has never been patched, running legacy Java and legacy Flash, protects itself on an unprotected network just with hardware, it's very cool. We do this one other thing with SGX, which is worth pointing out, because SGX gives me the ability to further protect user credentials on the operating system by encrypting them in user mode in an SGX enclave, so that even if the system somehow got corrupted by malware, that those high value credentials, and you could put other stuff in there too, cannot be stolen and dumped and used to go further into the enterprise. Yeah, the way I see it is that Bromium is really providing me with three key features. The first is endpoint isolation. The second point is application security. If, if, if one of my applications gets, gets breached, if it gets owned, if there's malware, if, if there's a crypto locker on it, I just kill it and it's done. It doesn't affect anything else because it doesn't have visibility to anything else. Right. But the third part, and this is the part that really excites me, is this idea that every endpoint, every application, every micro VM that is brought up gives my enterprise just a little bit more data. If I see an attack that starts to hit 5, 10, 20, 100 yeah. of my endpoints, I know this is something that I need to start warning my users about. Correct. The, and and this, these detailed forensics are fabulous because in general the security team is wondering who's attacking them and malware changes so quickly it, it lasts today less than a minute. And so we get these detailed forensics which allow us to go and look for signs of execution elsewhere in the enterprise environment, which are extraordinarily valuable, and that automates the entire kill chain analysis and remediation response on the part of the enterprise. So you don't have people sifting through a, essentially a haystack of alerts. First of all, there are no false alerts here. I want to be very clear, there are no false alerts. Why? Because we wait until it's arbitrarily bad. So we know it's bad, and then we get all this detail, and then we can go and automate the process of response. Uh, that just sounds like a toy chest for every system admin out there. Indeed. Now, I know you mentioned that it uses SDX, which means it's only going to work on Sky, Skylake and later processors. So when do you, start, do you expect to start to see this technology, Bromium really making it into the market? So actually, what, let's be very clear. We use whatever hardware is available. So on an old, all I want is something which is a Core i3 or i5, five years old or newer. On a Skylake system, which is the one I happen to have here, where I do have SGX, we discover that and use it, okay? But we also discover other features on the CPU that the operating system may not be able to support. So for example, Windows 7 doesn't support SMEP or DEP, okay? And we use those also to protect the system. But basically we have an ability, because we're privileged software, it's a hypervisor, to dig down and arbitrarily take the security goodness from the platform and use it to benefit software security. There is another key benefit which may not have been clear. 
I might be required in an enterprise environment to use legacy software. So I'm using Java 7 here because that's tied to Oracle ERP 11. There's no escaping it. And so users are sometimes tied into using unpatchable or unupgradable stuff, and they can do that quite safely. Simon, thank you very much for speaking with us. Thank you for sharing this technology. My great pleasure. If thank they you. wanted to find out more about Bromium, maybe if they wanted to find out where they could uh, talk to someone to potentially deploy it in their network, where can they go? I'm Simon at Bromium.com, B-R-O-M-I-U-M, or you can go to www.bromium.com. Thank you again. And uh, folks, if you're looking to protect something really, really big, Bromium suggests you use something really, really small. Video conferencing can be useful. And yes, it can even add some production to your workflow. But it also adds the dimension of your face. Your face needs to be ready to present. And sometimes we just don't have the time for that. Wouldn't it be nice if there was a way to move a couple of sliders, push a couple of buttons, and suddenly, boom, you're beautiful. That's exactly what we have here at the Intel booth. And that's why I'm speaking with Maya Resch, who's going to show how this application can help you put your face on. Maya Resch, what am I looking at? So uh, right over here, this is uh, using the small NUC over here, NUC device, which uses the sixth generation core. Uh, and then uh, basically you try and push a few sliders so that you can choose a profile for every person uh, that you want to beautify. Uh, maybe it's not looking nice on me, but if you want to turn on the red lips, okay, what do you do? You just push the slider on and you see red lips. Turn it on and off. How about, how about you want to enlarge your eyes? Here you go zombie look <laughs> you can you can turn this off again and now we, uh, the th the third section over here is basically changing the skin uh, skin tone and this is where you call smoothing where you can change the skin uh, smoothness and if you look if i turn it on and off it basically plays with my skin and this is the foundation where i can change to a green shrek look and turn it back off and that's pretty much all. If you can turn uh, turn off and on the features, you see there is a big change from where it was not beautified to where it is beautified. That's pretty much how face beautification looks on an Intel 6 Gen core and future generation platforms. Uh, what I love about this is it's not just facial detection, because we've seen facial detection programs in the past, but this needs to actually be able to look for individual features within a face. It needs to know where the lips are, it needs to know where the mouth is, where the nose are, where how big the eye should be. That's, uh, that's going to take some pretty interesting math. What exactly went into programming this app? So, so what it takes is first, uh, you, when you get a frame, you need to apply a face detection algorithm followed by landmark detection. And the landmark detection is the thing which actually tells you what is the eyes, where are the nose, where is the lips. And th those landmarks are, mo are, th are the key to basically changing each of the features because the lips red, you would need to know where your lips are. And then you apply the lip red on, on it so that you have the landmarks in the right place. Oh. I know that uh, the RealSense 3D camera also has the ability to do depth perception. So, you, for example, you could say only take the first five feet and then disregard all the information behind, which means I'd be able to, to blot out all of the background. Is there any uh, hope of maybe including that in a future version of the app? Uh, so, so yes, uh, RealSense uh, can can remove the background for sure. Uh, you you can you can select the range from which you you select your foreground, and you have a face which uh, in that foreground which would be beautified, and you can get rid of the background and replace it using uh, using a still image or using a motion a motion video. What all, all this can be done using uh, using RealSense camera? Yes. Myers, this is absolutely fantastic. Now, uh, is this is this available? Could they download this and play with it right now? So, so right now, this is more. Uh, th these features are available on Intel 6th Gen Core, uh, uh, and any any of the OEMs or ISVs could uh, could basically g any of the app developers could actually use use this and integrate into their app. You, you everything is running on the GPU, so you could even have your own other software filters on top of it, uh, and and have more additional features. So uh, basically, you any app developers can get this feature right now. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for sharing this. This is, this is one of the more fun spots that we've done in the show so far. Technology is great, but sometimes you just want to look pretty. We've seen a little bit of everything here at the Intel Developer Forum 2016 in San Francisco. If you want a really fast PC, 
go to the Kingston booth and see the fastest SSD in the world with over 7 gigabytes per second of transfer time. If you want to secure your network, talk to the folks over at Bromium who can use micro VMs to make sure that you never get owned again. If you want to see the latest in top of rack switches, drop by Canonical and see what Ubuntu Core can do for your data center. But mostly what the IDF does is to give like-minded individuals, geeks, makers, tinkers, engineers, whatever you might want to call them, a place to call their own. A place where they can see the latest and the greatest in technology, where they can talk to one another, share secrets, and most of all, create the community that we need for the next generation of IT. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Ballester, the Digital Jesuit, reporting for TWIT TV, saying goodbye from IDF 2016.